in every Episcopal church, somebody will say, uh, how do you become a member of this church? And we get this all the time here. How do you become a member of Christ Church? And our response to them is always, you are a member of Christ Church. Christ Church is a place that's so full of history, that sometimes the history can consume the place. And I'd say the last 11 years very much has been about jumping out of our history into the future rather than just living in our history. 39 families founded Christ Church in 1695. You know, Philadelphia is, was the center and the home, if you will, of uh, the earliest experiments in religious tolerance and diversity and religious freedom the vision of William Penn. And he had promised the King of England that he would allow the Church of England to build a church here. And he was good to his word. Uh, there's seven signers of the Declaration of Independence buried in the ground here, five signers of the Constitution. And for those uh, gentlemen, um, Christ Church was very much a home for them. Maybe the best known uh, member of Christ Church from the colonial area is Benjamin Franklin. He chose to be buried uh, at Christ Church. And Christ Church made a promise to him and his family that we would keep him for as long as necessary until God had other need of his remains. This magnificent building that was built uh, over a 54 year period of time was the most uh, unbelievably architecturally significant building uh, in the colonies. Uh, it was the highest structure. Uh, it's now consumed by skyscrapers, but it was the skyscraper of its time. And it very much communicated um, the power of the crown. But slowly, the spirit, the forces of religious liberty, the political times, a good clergy. They became uh, one of the very few Church of England parishes supportive of the revolutionary cause. And so very much the Episcopal Church is uh, formed in this place. This week is the 225th anniversary of the first general convention of the Episcopal Church held right here. The first presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church was the rector here. And I think that if you could somehow uh, communicate to him over the centuries and said, do you believe that there will ever be a woman presiding bishop in the Episcopal Church, he would have said, absolutely not, never. But he put into place uh, the democratic possibility that one day the Episcopal Church would elect a woman presiding bishop. And uh, that way, what happened here was quite revolutionary. That energy has always been about it. Christ Church, but I think we've especially done that in terms of using this old historical place and sort of throwing open the doors uh, to everyone we can get in here. Let the history attract people, but convince them that we have just as much future as we have past. In the colonial era, this was the center of power and the center of world power and, and where the government was. Just 120 years later, this entire area of Philadelphia where Christ Church now sits was essentially uh, sweatshops, uh, factories, tenements, uh, immigrants, and uh, because it was still a, a hoity-toity, pew-rent system, nobody came to a church here. I mean, church was almost empty. There was talk at one point of abandoning Christ Church and sort of setting up shops somewhere else where they could get real Episcopalians. And at that time, in the, uh, about 1910, they conceived of building a building bigger than Christ Church, uh, which is uh, across the street, which they named the neighborhood house, not the parish house, because they wanted it to be a place that served the neighborhood. Well, now here we are a hundred years later, that building is having its hundredth anniversary, and uh, we have to figure out, well, if it's supposed to serve the neighborhood, what's the neighborhood like today? Uh, it's art galleries, it's uh, restaurants. Uh, most of the residential neighborhoods are at a further distance. So we've conceived of repurposing that neighborhood house to be of service to the neighborhood as it is now. And the beauty of that is, for instance, in three weeks since it's reopening, we've had 3,000 people come into the neighborhood house for community arts programs and uh, a play about the Holocaust and a, and a, a puppet workshop theater. And those 3,000 people uh, come from all over the city, and we are starting to realize that we should treat them as our neighbors. Better yet, we should treat them like our parishioners. And they may not see themselves as church members, but if we do, we are in incorporating them. And this has been really quite a powerful way uh, 
over the last 11 years in which we've uh, attracted so many people into Christ Church. We've been fortunate in that we have had some great assistant ministers, like right now Susan Richardson, and she has been so devoted to uh, a demographic, if you will, uh, that frequently is 20s and 30s, but we try not to make it so age limited. Those folks decided to call that group the bridge, uh, both because we're near the Ben Franklin Bridge and because these are folks who seek to bridge people who feel comfortable in church and people who don't, and uh, a sort of intergenerational bridge, also bridging life and faith. I mean, y'all have really embodied so much about the future of the church and you've really shaped me, so thank you. In terms of a sense of mission or vision, when I came on, probably it was shared. It was both that uh, Tim, I think, was looking to grow a team of staff and leadership that would be connecting with the community in ways that had yet to become apparent to us, which I really like. Many times congregations will see people coming in and they'll try to over-incorporate them or say, oh wow, we're going to have that person here for five or ten years. We take very seriously that a person may be here for one time only, or a week, or a month, for however long that they're here. And for whatever reason, we are going to serve them as best we can as our members, as our parishioners. Many folks nowadays don't often have the option, or it's a, it's a real uphill battle, to be here regularly on a Sunday morning. Um, we certainly encourage it, and that's, we say that is when, that's the time when the uh, community is gathered. And yet we have to realize that not everybody can do that every Sunday and the numbers may be deceptive. That's a doorway we all need to walk through to get better insight into how folks are relating to the faith community. And I don't think it's that they're relating in a way that's less uh, intentional, less caring, less uh, fervent. Folks tend to come into a faith community through various portals or doorways. What draws you in? It might be the shelter meals. It might be the St. Barnabas mission. It might be the Tuesday evening program where you've got a small group and maybe you're more comfortable with that. So what I started doing was I would take us up to um, St. Barnabas Mission, which is a shelter for women and children in North Philly. And so I'd take the families up on Valentine's Day or a Sunday that was close to it, and we would have a Valentine's Day party in the shelter so that our children and the children there were simply at a party together. There wasn't about giving a handout, it wasn't about here's the money, it wasn't about who's in any position of authority. Similarly, the Bridge uh, Justice Work is going into a nearby homeless shelter. They make wonderful menus, they come back, they cook with the men, and then they eat with the men, and they play checkers and chess with the men. So it's really like with the St. Barnabas thing, it was about finding ways of doing justice work that's about being in relationship and really not having it be a we-they situation. Susan said something when she interviewed here years ago that still fires my imagination. Someone said, well, what's your view of outreach? Which in churches always means good things. Soup kitchens, sandwiches. Susan responded, church outreach is almost always about keeping people out. Outreach programs are when people feel like they must go and do something, but they never stop to say, you belong back where we've come from. The church has done this forever. It's done it to women, it's done to gays and lesbians, white churches have done it to minorities. What if outreach was welcoming in? Many of the people who do come to us do end up saying, I just didn't ever think I was going to find a place that really accepted all of me, including parts that seem very traditional, including parts that have never been at peace with the church, including parts that may have been wounded by um, the church. And I think that general ability to say genuinely, that no matter who you are, you are fully welcome here. And that's going to mean something different with every person that walks in the door. To be a part of uh, Christ Church uh, is to be in love with everything the Episcopal Church is. It's democratic Catholicity, it's diversity, it's ability to be a, a wide, embracing um, community. At the same time, uh, the Episcopal Church is really struggling. Uh, you know, our membership is down. We're full of division. We have uh, so many uh, churches that are uh, you know, under 100 people on Sunday morning. And you know, look at where we are today. We have a, a, you know, 
age diverse congregation. We have a new director of music who's doing you know, global hymnody and, 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 and playing an African drum on the floor where just a few years ago it was uh, you know, straight uh, Anglican liturgy. If Christ Church, founded 1695, so conservative and institutional over the history, if we can break out, if we can find ways to bring in a, a distrusting and highly secular public, if Christ Church can do that, anybody, any church can.